Welkom bij nog een episode van Wat met mij Willem Welzijn, een gezelsprogramma wat ik hier bouw vanuit mijn garage elke week in Belville. Quick disclaimer, if you are a English speaking listener who don't understand a word of Afrikaans, I would suggest that you fast forward about 5 or 6 minutes into this episode and then you can listen to my conversation with Michael Cross in English. But firstly, I have to speak to my regular Afrikaans listeners. Okay, fast forward now. Okay, now uh, the South is now forward. What say you? How are Yes, ek is jammer, ek het, uh, ek het daar spreek, fuck it, hier kom my goede trok voorbij. Ek sit in die kar, ek sit in die kar, in die parking lot, by my werk, want, dis ook om ek laas week nie episode gepost het nie, ek is so fucking bezig, ek het nie kans gehad om enig iets te doen nie, en uh, ek is jammer, ek vraag verskoning, ek het een week geskip. Maar ek meen laas, die vorige episode met Niel van Deventer was een fucking lange, en ek sal vir jou altyd nog iets extra gee, maybe drop ek een van die daar B-sides, weet soos twee episodes een week, of iets om op te maak vir hierdie week wat ek geskip het, so ek vraag om verskoning, laat ek uh, so lang klaas met jou gepraat het, maar baie dankie het jy ingeskakel het vandag, want ek het vir jou baie lekker episode, ek gesels met Michael Cross, hy was al op die podcast, hy was, kom ons kijk, goeie, so ek het nouds gemaakt, ek sit in een paar kniehaat voor my fucking werk, dit is so weird, ek voel so skyly, ek voel so so stout kind wat myself praat in die paar kniehaat, by die werk, <laughs> Jy loop iemand voorbij, hulle sien ek sit met headphones op in een kar. Jy weet, en hulle check wat de fuck doen ek, ek het notes en alles. Maar, oké, okay, wie doet ons op die show vandag? Ons het vir Michael Kras op die show en hy is documentair filmmaker en ons gesels met hom vandag oor sy nieuwe fliek The Fun's Not Over, The James Phillips Story. Uh, dit gaan oor James Phillips, a.k.a. Bernold is niemand wat gespeel het in uh, The Cherry Face Lurchers, Corporal Punishment, Illegal Gathering en hy was ook een baie belangrike ingredient in die destijdse voelvrij beweging. En Michael Kras, die ouwe wat die documentaire gemaakt het oor, oor James Phillips, hy was al op die podcast geweest. kom ons kyk gauw hier wanneer, op episode 72, saam met Jonathan Handley van die Radio Rats, en toe het hy kom gesels vir die documentaire wat hy gemaakt het oor die Radio Rats, en hy documentaire sy naam is Driving and Dying, En uh, Michael is nou hierdie keer alleen op sy eie ingekom vir die interview, want hy het die bevokte dakkie gemaakt oor James Phillips. En die ding het awards gewen, man. Hy het klomp awards gewen. Een van die awards die gewen het is uh, die Audience Award Winner, Best South African Documentary at the 20th Encounters South African International Documentary Festival. Hierdie documentaire, waar ons vandag in gesels, is op pad London toe. Het ek nog een paar luisteraars in London. Ek het moest al een paar e-mails gekryf van mense in London. So, zaterdag die 27ste oktober 2018, kan jy die documentaire gaan kyk by Courthouse in Soho, en het is in Londen, en het begin 2 uur, en het eindig 4 uur. En daar so nog voor dit, het ons enige uh, luisteraars nog in Amsterdam en Nederland, ja ons het, ek het al een paar boodskappe van nice mense gekry in Nederland, wat na die wat podcast luister, soos jylle sy Afrikaanse dokumentaar wil gaan kyk, was een screening wat gebeur, en dit gebeur by die Zuid-Afrika huis. So, dit is in Amsterdam, en dit is dinsdag die 23ste oktober, half 8 die aand, en jy kan jou bespreking maak by, sien jy, ek gaan dit maar vir jou spel, dit is, uh, even M en 10, so dit is, E, V, E, N, E, M, E, N, T, E, N, at Zuid-Afrika huis, dit is at, Z-U-I-D-A-F-R-I-K-A-H-U-I-S dot N-L Jy kan jou besprekings maak daar en die, vir my Zuid-Afrikaanse luisteraars die fliek het al gewaas by hele paar plekke in Zuid-Afrika, maar as jy die DVD wil hee dan kan jy dit kry by Ruisten Records in Cape Town of jy kan het kry by Mr. Vinyl in Joburg of jy kan het kry by Kaya Records in Durban vir enige ander informatie oor die documentaar kan jy gaan na thefunsnotover.com toe. Dit is thefun, en dan s, notover.com. En gaan vind jy bykie uit meer daar oor. Man, dit is nou, James Phillips is een van die belangrikste ouwens in onze Zuid-Afrikaanse muziekgeschiedenis. My droom sal wees nog enig op die James Phillips stage te speel. Ek het wel al op die Steak and Ale stage gespeel, in, uh, in Centurion, wat nou een paar jaar terug afgebrand het, uh, maar destijds het ek op die stage gespeel, en James Phillips, dat was al groot painting van hom, so in die achtergrond, die weet net achter die stage, en dit is nogals, ek meen, die ouwe is fucking belangrik gewees, maar dan is niemand, hou my vast koper al, en uh, I mean, uh, shot down, die songs, Jesus, ok, die, en ek het die documentaire gelove, en het was baie cool met Michael Cross te gesels, oor die documentaire, en om te gesels oor sy vorige projecte, so jy gaan hierdie baie geniet, ek praat in Engels, ek hoop jy klink soos een poepel nie, er was nog iets wat ek vir jou moet vertel, vandag is die 19 oktober, Kerswees is om die draai en is altyd moeilik om vir jou pa of vir jou boete of vir jou oom of vir jou opa iets te koop wat fucking spuf is. 
so as jy iets kief wil bestel by my, dan kan ek jy nou hierdie tip gee. Daar word 20 roosters gemaakt. Stainless steel braai roosters en hulle lyk soos gitare. Ek noem hulle die Blitzkrieg braaikasters. So ek sê nou vir jou exclusively eerste, vir jy wat nou luister die naam. As jy een wil hee, nee, dan stuur jy vir my e-mail na williamwelfare.gmail.com toe, dan betaal jy my a deposit toe, wat die helfte is van wat die rooster kost, en dan word jy gegarantie dat jy een kry, en sodra ek kom by my het, en ek gee om vir jou, dan betaal jy my die ander helfte. Maar dan word 20 gemaakt, soos jy een wil hee, en jy wil pre-order en pre-pay, dan kan jy nou die helfte betaal, en as hy klaar is oor een maand, kan jy die ander helfte betaal, en dan het jy a fucking cool percent vir jou pa, opa, oom, buddy, broer, swaar, ek meen, daar is nie baie, daar is so ver, is daar nog nie 30 gemaakt van hulle, en daar word nou nog 20 gemaakt, so special edition, Christmas editions, maar dan moet jy nou bestel, ek praat van in die volgende dag of 2 of 3, want die mense maak my fucking mal aan my op Facebook, ek gaan nie vir jou first option, stuur vir my e-mail na williamwelfare.gmail.com toe, en dan praat ons daar, ok, wat nou van geeks, daar is nog een geek wat opkom, wat my eie shows aanbetref, ons in die dag gespeel in Bohemia, saam met Benny, ons nieuwe gitarist, en ek en Kyle en Gitch, ons is a four piece band, ons is saam met die band, en ek had black gespeel, dit was a fucking lekker show, dankie vir al die mense wat kom support het, dan was a paar baie nice mense by die show, ons was a goeie ene, ons rook het nogals met a fucking four piece band, die songs klink legit, en jy kan die four piece band sien, wanneer, die 24 november, maak vir jou besprekings, by Kuroo Saloon, maak sy my fucking naweek afvan, klim jy in jou buddy in die kar, en dan kom bly jylle die saterdag aand, by Kuroo Saloon op die Route 62, jy kan akkomodatie daar bespreek, jy kan nie aan na slaap, dit is die 24 november, is die saterdag, maak jy besprekings by 072-250-9055, as jy in Spallendam bly, of jy bly in Barrydale, of jy bly in Albertinia, of daar op jy N2, ek meen, die is nabij genoeg vir jou, vir die lekker plattelandse jol, vir jy, as jy op Lady Smit bly, soos my hometown, ek weet jy of al enig iemand is op Lady Smit, wat nog volg wat ek doen nie, maar kom, fucking pull in, jy weet, sal ek wees my paar ou connections te check, by die geek, die 24ste november, 2018, by die Kuroo Saloon, op die Rootsie Situ, en dan die volgende dag, die 25ste, doen ons ook een open set vir Jan Blom, so acoustic type vibe, en Jan Blom speel die middag daar, die 25ste op die zondag, so as jy een biker is, of jy is een ou wat like van travel en van fucking rock'n'roll, dan skiem ek jy met een pool op die reductie toe, daai naweek. Ok, dis dit van my kant af. Ek wens, ek kan jou alles vertel wat in my leven gebeur het die afgelopen twee weke, maar ek kan nie, jy weet, want, jy weet, daar is net partij goed wat so fucking mal is, maar ek jou dit sê, ek het kakhard gewerk by my die job, en dis nie net die job, jy is ek fucking career, en ek doen kief shit, en ek impress mense, en ek doen my werk, en dis hoe kom ek so, bykie laat was met die podcast, so ek vraag om verskoning daar oor. Ok, let's listen to my interview with Michael Cross, the documentary filmmaker, who is currently in Amsterdam, and then is going to London. Yeah, so here we go. An interview in English, I hope you enjoy it. Face for radio and all that. Yeah. Face for radio, face for radio. <laughs> you, you, you got a pretty face. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You say the sweetest thing. Can I have a light there, dude? Yes, you may. Yeah, so, uh, no, so this is the this is the fifth film, um, sort of music-related film. Mm-hmm. The first one was in 2005, which was on two Durban musicians, Sid Kitchen, uh, Madala Kaneni. Yes. Um, I then made a film about a band I, I was hugely fond of called Scooters Union that not that many people know. They actually oh. played one of the early oppies um, and came out of a band called Underground Press. It was very cool. Um, I made a film about a guy called Brendan Shields. Yeah, the guy from Bethlehem. Yeah, yeah. Rock D- started. Did you make that film? Yeah. And, and, and it's a, I mean, I loved it. I thought it was amazing from a point of view of that there was this guy literally running the spur in Bethlehem and writing these incredible songs. And I mean, he really, he's an amazing songwriter. But, um, but I thought that guy was a parody artist, you know, because of his music video and yeah, he portrayed himself like that in, no, that, in those years. You know, that was my made, perception of that. He made no effort at any point to, to kind of fit in or, f- or, or kind of make it easy for himself. <laughs> but I mean, that song, Rockstardom, is an incredible tune. I mean, it really is. And the, the video mm. is like sort of more or less a one take that we shot on a bridge. I built this rig did you build speakers did you do that video helmet. yeah that's my video yeah. that's a fucking amazing and it's a video. gopro on a um on a pole on a crash helmet facing back at him and 
<laughs> there were some other ideas for the video at one point, which was going to be a guy basically like um, with sort of uh, explosives strapped himself. He was going to basically go into record companies and threaten to sort of blow them up if they didn't give him a deal. <laughs> um, funny enough, he did get a, a deal briefly. But, uh, you know, the thing which was kind of weird is is he – chose uh, and he sort of said as much in the film of that look if, if this thing doesn't work out I'm, i can't keep doing this forever I'm, yeah. you know and basically he's back at the spur and it, it didn't work out um but you know there's something amazing you you know you were kind enough to have me here with jonathan from the radio rats and the thing about the rats that uh, that i always loved is that they refused to to lie down at any point so yeah. they just kept going and yeah. i mean it's been 40 years and they're recording at the moment in Cape Town. They got some shows this week, and um, you know, I kind of, I do think, in a sense, if you if you're going to do this thing and you're going to be a, an artist or a, a creative person on some level, you've actually got to just keep plugging. I've been there like five years, for five six years on the road, just during making albums. You you pigeonhole yourself because uh, um, there aren't so many people in the country who's going to buy your music and sustain you for the rest of your life. No, absolutely. You know? I mean, look, we're getting onto the James film now without a sort of formal intro of any sort, but there's a thing that came out of the film that I thought was very interesting that Lloyd Ross said, and Lloyd mm. Ross is obviously the guy behind Shifty. Without Lloyd, there's no Kurs, there's mm. no uh, Kirk Oral, there's no Bernaldus, uh, you know, never mind all the other stuff that he did. But he said a whole thing which I thought was really interesting, which is that if you're in the States mm. and you have a cult audience and you tour, you can survive yeah. because it's such a huge market that a small number of – a small percentage of the market needs to dig what you're doing and it pays the bills and yeah. you can live. And, of course, uh, now increasingly with you know sort of CD stores and record stores not really being a huge source of income for artists, you can also sell shit at your gig so you yeah. can make a living. Um, if you're in a big enough market, but yeah. if you're in a small market and your niche – you, of course you can't make a living. They just aren't the numbers. But the thing is, with most artists are temperamental in the sense of they want to have that integrity, so they want to do it full time, and then they burn themselves out, and then the songs don't keep on coming. Where someone like Jonathan Hanley, he's an atheist, he's got a he's got a day job, but he keeps on writing fucking songs. And you know? he writes more than any full time dedicated musician that I know. I mean, he really does. Yeah. You know, the thing that's also interesting about about James is that. James always gave 100% to everything that he did, I think. Um, and I think, and that's the other thing, is that if you are putting all your eggs in that basket and if you're doing it to that degree and it doesn't work and there isn't the, the kind of financial security out of it, it's a really fucking hard life, you yeah. know? And, I mean, I think that's the other thing that, that, that people forget is there's obviously a measure of, of sort of glamour around certain aspects of the music industry, but... The bottom line also is it's fucking hard work, you know. Yeah. No one tells you that. Before we get to all of the films you've done, I want to, because the last time you came to visit, you were here with Jonathan Anley and we uh, we spoke about the Radio Rats document you did. Jiving uh, and Dying. Jo yeah. yeah, Jiving and Dying. And, um, and obviously the spotlight was more focused on him because he's the guy from the Radio Rats and you were here you were like the wingman you know, <laughs> on the on the episode I like but that. I but, like the but, sound of that. but now i've got you alone oh, you know? yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> well there's so, a dog in the room i should hasten to add which is, sounds terribly perverse <laughs> yeah that dog's me yeah, that's it. <laughs> but okay let's let's go back uh, where did where did you grow up because i want to i want to uh, sure no yeah. I, I grew up in durban and i've never left um you know, it's a cemetery with traffic lights in some respects. <laughs> There's not a hell of a lot going on. I think what Durban has done is it's always produced amazing artists mm -hmm. and they've always left yeah. um, because it's a really – it's not a, an easy town. Um, I mean, one of the things that people don't realize is whenever any big acts come to Durban in, uh, come to South Africa, they skip Durban. Yeah. And they skip Durban for a reason. is because Durbanites don't come out in numbers to support them. And I, I don't know if it's true or not, but I got told that when REM did that Around the World tour, which I think was 2008, I could be wrong, maybe a bit before even. I think it was around then, maybe a bit earlier that there was a kind of a number that the promoters said, if we get that many people, yeah. then we'll keep bringing shows. And they were like 4,000 short of that number. And basically, 
Durbanites don't come out and support music to the degree that I believe they should. But it's an amazing town, and there's an amazing community of creative people. Well, um, they, they, they've got some comedy fans because Dave Chappelle is going to be playing Durban in November. Yeah, no, in exactly. December, yeah. yeah, I believe so. And, and I mean, the thing I, I think for me is just being that it's a, a place I'm like super familiar with. Yeah. Um, I feel no inclination to, to be anywhere else. Um, and I'd like to keep making films about musicians. But what you know? uh, what did your parents do? When uh, you were... Both of them were in the arts, and mm-hmm. I guess it's kind of inevitable. My dad was involved with what was NAPAC, the Performing mm-hmm. Arts Council. My mom was a, a costume designer for the stage. She was a painter. Um, so they certainly didn't uh, kind of steer us in any way toward my sister and I towards sort of creative mm-hmm. stuff, but they tolerated these things. So my first kind of um, involvement with music was um, I used to write for a magazine called Vula. I also used to write. Yeah, wait, reviews. wait, wait! Before, before. Yeah, that, yeah, 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 So, yeah. so your parents, they were uh, sort of in theatre and, yeah. and in the arts, and and, and, there, and there was a job. Yeah, no, no, they were both full time, uh, kind of working in in the arts. I always joke that the abuse in my family was all musical because I used to, used to have to listen to fucking show tunes and things, you know, so like <laughs> Rogers and Hammerstein and stuff, you know. Um, but yeah, so they kind of, um, they, they sort of didn't push us in any way towards um, the arts, but kind of when we found ourselves there, there uh, my sister and I were both sort of involved. They were enormously tolerant and but, supportive. But I mean, did you go and see a lot of shows when you were a kid? Yeah, no, shit. I, um, my dad was originally a publicist, so I literally, as a, a babe in arms, was sort of sitting in the back row while they were doing photo shoots and opera and stuff like that, which, as and, I said, is and, probably why I have a block against opera, but anyhow. But what, what do you remember of those days? Of, um, of, of what, in, what, what did you see there? That uh, that you you still remember that still left the mark. Uh, funny enough, I, I remember certain shows, um, and quite often they were, were relatively small plays um, that were were amazing. Where I, I was way too young to be exposed to them in many respects, but they were really kind of things that struck a, a chord. But music's always been this thing, and mm. I also always knew that I was never going to play. I mean, I tried to play. I was no. a really average drummer, and I, I bought a bass guitar for a while. But I kind of, I, th- I think also if, if you love something and you, you know, like if you love fine art and you can't paint, then you should probably be involved with a gallery because maybe that's how you can be a part of the industry um, but not be expected to paint a masterpiece that you're going to sell. So you knew your limitations early on. Oh, hell yes. Yeah, no, absolutely. And from, a, from a musical perspective. Totally. Sorry, yeah. And music was, was definitely the thing. I mean, I... I think I was very lucky also to see classical music performed by like a 60-piece orchestra as a very young kid. Yeah. And I mean, that really made an impression. And I think I also started to hear, I didn't realize that not everybody hears individual instruments when they hear music. They're people yeah. who hear like the sound. Yeah. And I got into listening to what individual people were doing. And, and you know, you're sort of just listening to music in a slightly different way, I guess, to how some people hear mm. music. Um, but as I said, I had absolutely no talent, but this real love and, and passion for, for, for music. And uh, the film thing came along as being something which I started kind of getting into. Again, it's the, the memories of, of films that were like really impactful uh, as a young kid. I, I mean, I saw Jaws way too young. Yeah. I saw films like Close Encounters and, you know, some of the – funny enough, as I say that, I realize they're all Spielberg films, but uh, – Duel, actually, his first film is a fantastic film. I was telling someone the other day about a guy in a truck chasing some dude in a small car. But anyhow, um, so yeah, film was also this thing. So it was to try and find a way to combine film and music. And that's really what ended up happening and kind of what I try and do now. But when you were in high school, what were you thinking you were going to do after school? Oh, I had absolutely no idea. Um, and I'm kind of, there were a few misfires. I, I thought at one stage, perhaps I should get into sort of PR, you yeah. know, um, and I loathed that. But one of the component subjects um, of the public relations diploma was journalism mm. as a, a, a part of the course. So I ended up doing a journalism diploma. Um, and then also realized I, I don't um, – at Technicon Natal, which mm. was – you basically in those days it was there or Rhodes. And I, I, as I said, I kind of chose to stay in Durban and – um, that was also interesting, but again, it wasn't a thing that felt like that was really what I was meant to do. And I, I kind of, I think I can write, but again, it doesn't come easily to me. It's, um, 
Yeah, it's hard work. Yeah. And somehow, um, it's then labor. As, yeah, it's as part labor. of the journalism degree, there mm. was a, a, a film component to that. Um, sort of more, I think, trying to get people into being able to function as TV journalists. Yeah. So I kind of got a sense of, of how TV was made. I got into editing, which is still a real passion for how me. How was TV made in those days? Well, I mean, the thing, it's also... What, what year was this? This would have been mid-80s. Yeah. Uh, and the thing that's amazing, um, and there's a parallel in, in music as well, is that TV then, equipment was outrageously expensive. Mm. So to edit video, you required two Betacam machines, which was the broadcast format at the time, and each of those machines cost a quarter of a million rand. Fuck. So you couldn't edit for broadcast without an investment of a minimum of half a million. So there was a suite you had to go to. Absolutely. And, of course, you could never own that stuff because it was just too expensive. Yeah. So in the same way as music's gone from being something you had to go to a studio to make, you can now you know, buy a Mac and get a sound card and you're in the game. Yeah. Uh, the film business got to a point where you could buy a Mac and, and have a decent video card and, and get camcorders and, and things could start to happen. So it kind of, uh, I think I was quite lucky in a way in terms of when I started wanting to make films that it suddenly became way more affordable. Yeah. And I mean, funnily enough, the films I'm making now, I'm, I probably shouldn't be admitting this, but I'm making them on a 10-year-old iMac, you know, oh. um, that cost me 20 grand then. Um, so, you know, it suddenly became, you know, it's a bit like what punk did, I think, is that it suddenly made people realize that they could express themselves and you didn't need an industry behind you. You could kind of do your own thing. And I think with the, the sort of film and music coming together and trying to make these documentaries is it was never... There was never a thought other than that there were these artists that people should know about and didn't know about, and I could maybe try and find a way of helping them become aware of these people. Okay, by the way, before we go there, yeah. so mid-80s, yeah. do, doing the diploma, you said it was like a misfire kind of thing. Yeah, because I How mean, um, in terms of the writing, you know, there were, there were sort of all these weird aspects to the diploma, including a subject called press law. Oh, wow. Which was incredibly complicated. Uh, you know, you had all this legislation in the 80s specifically designed to kind of limit the, the media. So you couldn't write about whatever you wanted to. And I mean, and this that was, was during and, and the that state was, of emergency. And that and was part that. of your curriculum. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a subject I failed three consecutive years, you know. So um, I just never, I, I kind of could never really handle some of that aspect of it. And it was not... Uh, um, uh, what's the word? It wasn't sort of unbridled creativity at all. No. There were all these kind of limitations. And and also, I mean, for my prac, I ended up writing for a, a magazine called Natal Equipment News, and it was literally like reviewing forklift trucks wow. and engineering stuff. Which What is a like niche so, publication. Yeah, absolutely. But, I mean, it's just so not kind of what I was interested in. And And it's funny how I think sometimes if you – you can sort of stumble into where you meant to be. I don't think, you know, your path is necessarily always clear. So how did you stumble into where you needed to um, be? I met Sid. Uh, I was writing record reviews, yeah. um, which again was, I suppose, the beginnings of trying to combine music and some other thing apart from playing it um, for Scope magazine, which was fantastic. How did, you get, how did you get that gig? I got that gig through a guy called Richard Haslop, who is without a doubt the finest music journalist in the country. He used to have a show on... on uh, um, SAFM for many years called Roots to Fruits. Yeah. Um, great writer, still writes um, uh, for some publications. But yeah, he got me the gig and I would sort of do the record reviews that he didn't want to do. And it's funny, I, I realized the other day I actually reviewed James's Sunny Skies album wow. for Scope. But I mean, I remember some of the albums. I re reviewed the first Dave Matthews album, a band called The Charlatans, who I loved, who were cuts of Stone Roses. Yeah, I did the second Stone Roses album. Um, but then I also did terrible stuff, you know, Susanna Hoffs from the Bangles solo album and, you know, some of these sort of things. But, but, but I mean, writing for a pornography magazine in the mid-80s, hey, that look, must I'll have been what, fucking… Scope, Scope was an incredible magazine because, I mean, obviously what I remember, and I gather you obviously do too, is sort of, you know, these like centerfolds. And, I mean, there was also that brilliant thing where they would have stars yeah. over people's uh, – over people's – over women's <laughs> nipples. Yeah. You kind of like – it's like if, a scratch card. Yeah, I mean, well, exactly. And you we, always we won. all scratched. Uh, yeah, <laughs> you always won. <laughs> exactly, exactly. But I mean, that that was that was the beginning of sort of writing about music. And then there was also a publication called Vula, which mm. was an amazing magazine. It had a relatively short life, um, 
and it was kind of during the height of of the sort of state of emergency and when the sort of towards the mid to late eighties when things were kind of pretty crazy and um it was also an opportunity now to start being exposed to people like the shifty guys yeah. um I reviewed sid uh Sid Kitchen's demos of his first album um uh, Sid Kitchen the utensils album. And um And he, he was he was Durban based at that totally stage. Totally Durban based. Yeah. And his and as with the whole band and his whole thing was he sort of said, Look, come and join us as a non performing musician. And what's also quite weird to give him some credit is when the first album came out they sort of photographs of the band and I'm photographed as part of the band. And I don't know if anyone else ever did that. I thought it was quite an amazing thing that he sort of said, look, you know, I kind of acknowledge the role that you're playing, even though you don't play an instrument. Yeah. So I was like his sort of publicist organizer. I, I was going to say, you can't really use the word manage because he was completely unmanageable. <laughs> um, but, but I gave it my best shot. And um, So did you meet him before you reviewed the album? No, I went to go and meet him and he had a, a little guitar shop called Sid Kitchen's Guitar Saloon um, mm. in, in um, sort of downtown Durban. And that's where I, I met him. And again, it was this thing of wanting to be part of something and knowing that my role in it would never be to pick up an instrument. And oh. I was absolutely fine with that. And I still am. I mean, I still love being around musicians doing what they do. Yeah. Um, and I don't feel any compulsion to um, pick up an instrument. I'm or to very compete with them or something. Not yeah. at all. I'm very happy to be sort of um, supportive in whatever role and just to be a part of it because it's an amazing thing. I mean, I really have genuine sympathy for people who go through their life working their asses off and there is nothing of them left behind when they go. Yeah. And I mean, it's that typical thing of, you know, the guy at, standard bank or whatever i mean yeah. you know he can put in however many years he can get the pen and he can get the big office but his existence means nothing yeah. he's, he leaves nothing there's no legacy of any sort so when he's gone they get another guy in yeah. who services their loans department or there's no greatest hits of signed nothing, checks or stamps nothing uh, uh, and i mean i think the thing is look there are obviously people who who for whom that's fine and I just kind of always felt like I really would like to be involved with things that are um, to some degree uplifting, perhaps, or that, uh, interesting. That has, that has more meaning. Yeah, and, and I, th I also think… Was, well, sorry, but was, mm. was there a moment where you discovered that notion, where you went, ah… Oh. Do you know, I think, I think it may well have actually been when Sid's first album came out, and it was… It was amazing. It's such a kind of unusual time because this is the other thing that, you know, things move so quickly one forgets. But when that album came out, which I think was about 85, 86. Mm. Fuck, I was, it was two years old. <laughs> <laughs> I was 19, but I was still young. But, I mean, there was basically, um, there was one record pressing plant in South Africa. So if you made an album, there was only one place you could press it. Yeah. Um, there was one guy. Um, I wish I could remember his name, his surname. I think it was a Kritzinger. I could be wrong. He was a like a, a sort of Burukes kind of guy, a yeah. lovely guy, lovely guy. Um, but he was the only guy who mastered albums. So when your album was ready, it went to him. So if you were, you know, wild youth or, or some kind of <laughs> punk band at the time, that was the guy who had to to help you get your record he ready the, for press. He, he was the gatekeeper. He yeah. was the only dude. Yeah. Um, and I think seeing that album come out eventually, getting it on radio, I mean, funny enough, some of those DJs are still around, people like Barney, um, Alex J, Chris Pryor, Neil Johnson. They were guys who played that stuff. And I think suddenly I, I kind of felt like I was part of something that had got out there. Yeah. And I think that's the other thing is that, to me, getting your stuff out there should almost be an end in itself. Yeah. And that's become incredibly simple now because of SoundCloud and Facebook and YouTube and all that stuff. You know, that's also got to be said that it's incredibly hard to have your stuff yeah. noticed because of how much stuff there is. Yeah, it's cluttered. It's, it's, it's absurd. It's white noise. It's like, yeah, <laughs> totally. And I mean, yeah. it's, it's also that thing of, you know, you, you find yourself thinking, well, what do you have to do to be noticed and there was a time when all you had to do to be noticed was actually to bring out an album yeah. you know that album was considered for airplay and and we were lucky enough to get it it would be reviewed um so you know once you'd got to the point where you'd pressed up and i think we pressed maybe 500 copies i could be wrong it might even have been less might yeah. have been 250 but i think there was it was like the minimum run yeah but just that it was like okay i'm a part of this thing that didn't exist that does now and that came to mean a lot to some people and that's the other thing of kind of doing stuff that means something it 
doesn't necessarily matter how how many people it means something to. What matters is that it means a lot to some people. Yeah. Um, and I think, I mean, I think that should be true of virtually any artist. You know, if you create a work and it's not, you know, globally embraced, but it blows a few people away and means something to them, that's 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 good enough. Yeah. You know? Did you finish that diploma? No, 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 no. I bailed. Eh? Um, I, they, it sort of got to a point also where I suddenly was doing what I wanted to do. So I switched from the the PR to journalism, and then from journalism to video yeah. technology. And then I got offered a, a video job as an editor at a, a company called the Video Lab, who were the big yeah. kind of company. They had Joburg, Cape Town, and Durban branches at that point. And it kind of seemed crazy to carry on studying when I just landed what, to yeah. me at that point, was like the dream job. You know, why would you go back to lectures you know, when what, you can edit? In, were you in that time frame where you had to go do din- Dinsplech? Oh no, dude! I was very clever. Eh? I dodged. I really dodged. Yeah. Uh, what I did, which um, um, if it ever came back, I would kind of probably do very well as a consultant on how to avoid <laughs> having to go. Well, no, what I did is I just that, kept, that, on, that, kept that, on that Buzzfeed list. Yeah, I just kept on enrolling on in new diplomas. So they would come to me and go, "You must be finished now." You know, in December, and I'd be going like, "No, I'm in first year of something new." And they'd be like, "Oh shit, okay, we'll come back when you finish that one." And they'd come back and they'd be going. You must be in third year now. No, no, I'm actually in first year of my third diploma. Fuck. And I just kept doing that until it, it was no longer a requirement. Fuck. My whole thing was always, I was, you know, there were certain people I wanted to kill, but I wasn't going to kill strangers. You know? <laughs> and I also always thought I'd probably kill bungalow mates or whatever. You know, I just, I definitely wouldn't have been cut out for military service. So you fucking dodged it, huh? Yeah, no, look, I mean, I, I also wasn't. Yeah, I mean, it's like I was kind of reasonably politically active, but I also wasn't a candidate for for an exile. You know, that wasn't going to happen. So it was a case of trying to sort of tap dance my way around it, and it worked. And I'm really grateful it worked. I mean, I know I might not be able to iron the way people who went to the (laughs) army can, and, um, you know, I might not shoot well or whatever, but... I, I, it always seemed to me that it would not have been a good fit. Yeah, of course, yeah. it really wouldn't. Because have, eh? because m- most of the musicians that you made documentaries of are people who went there and who wrote about it and uh, and who rebelled against yeah. it. Yeah, and look, I mean, I think to some degree, uh, maybe if I had gone, I might have had something interesting to say about the experience. But I also might have been completely broken by the experience. Yeah. And I know a lot of sensitive, creative types. To whom that happened, yeah. um, you know. They're, they're, James says a very interesting thing in the film where he talks about how, you know, Afrikaans and English people were taught to hate each other just as much as as, as white people and black people were, yeah. but that somehow going to the army, he realised that there was common ground. Um, that you know that we could all kind of get on. So there there are positives that come out of, you know, putting people together for two years and making them do that stuff, but. Yeah, I'm very, very grateful I didn't have to go. And um, as I said, I, I dodged, and I'm like n- not even remotely ashamed to say I'm very, very pleased that they never <laughs> caught me because I just I was not have been good material. I wasn't officer material. Oh my fast go put on the material. <laughs> exactly. Okay, so so you worked at the video lab. Jumping, this was at the yeah. same time as as working with certain things, yeah. and and then basically um, what ended up happening was. Um, I think it would have been late eighties. Um, there was a Durban band called Underground Press, who yes. were a group of um, at that stage schoolboys. I mean, they were literally all. When I met them, they were in Snatter Nine, so they would have been you know, fifteen, sixteen, maybe sixteen, going on seventeen. Um, and they were fantastic. I mean, they really were something unbelievably special. And um, the moment I, I heard them, I kind of said, "Listen." You know, um, let me try and help you guys. Uh, I incurred the wrath of several of their parents because one of them ended up dropping out of a degree and they were going to be rich and famous and we were going to, you know, take over the world. And we did an album. We recorded at Shifty, um, you know, and it was it was an amazing time. And, yeah, I, there's always been – there's obviously a hole in my life that I have to fill with this stuff because if I look back, there was never a time – when I didn't have a pet project, yeah. um, you know, and it literally, you know, went through these bands, and and Brendan was no different. I heard Brendan Shields' stuff, and I thought, shit, this guy's amazing. But but you know what? What's what interesting about you is that while you're talking, I'm going, fuck, I've been part of one of your pet projects. Yeah, 
Dude, you were on Richtung Bevolk. Yeah, on Richtung Bevolk, which, which is people, Gagari people still, Hesselman. People Fuck. still come to me. They, I've, I've got to tell you, and it's, this is absolutely honest, that they are, I would say once every kind of three or four months, somebody goes to me, that is like the greatest South African album fucking ever made. But but just to give the listeners, uh, well, j- j- just to talk to them about the Richtung Bevolk, this was in 2012, 13. Somewhere around there. Yeah, where you it's were part of, of uh, 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 Piet Pers, G- Gary Usman, who was the he was the bass player for the Gereformeerde uh, Blues Band. He played with... He was uh, in the band The Carols. He was in the, uh, uh, the Carols. He was, was at, um, he also was uh, um, uh, hugely influential on a whole lot of people because he was working at Hillbrow Record Center yeah. for 10, 15 years. Um, and the thing with Gary was I met him in Joburg. I'm just not 100% sure. Actually, I lie. I'd, I've known him for years, okay? Yeah. And then I was in Joburg, and I I realized I hadn't heard from him for a while. And I sort of gave him a call, and he was going through like a rough patch mm. and, and everything. And I said to him, but are you still writing? And he said, shit, yeah, you know, I've got loads of songs. So I said, well, send me some of the demos. I'd love to hear them. No big plans, nothing. He said 90 songs. Fuck. Um, and I would say half of them were were absolutely fantastic. Um, the other half were kind of weird as fuck, but the <laughs> the other half were were just great songs. And Gary's a great songwriter. And I thought, shit, you know, maybe we can do something. But you know, he was uh, not in a position where he he was living kind of pretty rough. Um, so um, yeah, so I gave Gary a call. Um, and he uh, said that he had all this material and he sent it to, to me and I heard it and there's so, so much of it was so great and I thought, shit, we should really try and do something. But I mean, at that point, it, I wasn't in a position to fund it in any way. But you, um, you did it so smartly because I remember I was sitting at, at the Rolling Stone offices working and I got a message from you, never heard of you. And you say, okay, cool, um, I'm making an album for Gary. Uh, here's the track. Uh, if you want to record vocals, go and record vocals. And and I took my – this these – Fucking mics, this podcast mics. I was living with my with my fucking mother in law, <laughs> and and I, and and I recorded the track in the dressing room, and in her dressing room, yeah, I, I, but because it, it was like sound booth, and I was like on this podcast equipment. I, I just got it, you know, and that's how I recorded th- that song. But myself. look, I must tell you what was amazing to me about that was there are forty musicians on mm. that album, and everybody's there. Francois, oh no, um, I mean, you Albert name Frost. it. Yeah, Albert Frost, Chris Letcher, these amazing people are, are on the record. And the whole thing I also realized, and again, you know, giving away s- secrets here, but I knew I couldn't ask any one person to do all of it. There was yeah. no way. It would be asking too much of anyone, yeah. and frankly, too much of anyone, even with, with wadges of cash. So I made a point of not asking anyone to do more than I thought they would be comfortable doing. And there were a lot of people who had huge respect for Gary. Gary ran a label called Tick, Tick, Bang at one point, which was um, after the demise of Shifty was like the independent label in the country. And he gave a lot of people a break. But but Renecha won there, so Paul Reichert Mm. came in. Um, He released Matthew van der Vant and Chris Letcher's album, so Chris was keen. So there were all these people who felt they owed and did owe Gary something. Not felt they owed, they absolutely did. And I think on some level, I kind of called them on that without, as I said, at any point asking too much of any one person. So what ended up happening was, yeah, 40 musicians, nine studios. um, Nobody worked on more than three or four tracks. So people like Willem Muller, who were part of the GBB. Um, I think he did maybe three or four uh, that he played on, but with different vocalists, uh, Warwick Sony, um, he did one or two. So it just kind of um, ended up being this amazing um, collection of people doing stuff out of love and goodwill, and you can hear it. And, I mean, it's the most, I mean, Rotten Bofork is just also such a great title because, I mean, this is not, there is no genre (laughs) that covers it. You know, it's in... Multiple languages. It's and wh- every conceivable genre. And where does the uh, w- dilemma come from? Um, G- Gary's got this weird thing. Um, every time we ever did stuff, I mean, we did an album together years ago where he called himself Archie Pelago. Yeah. And it was this whole thing of no man's an island. He's an archipelago. You know, <laughs> Archie Pelago. Yeah. And dilemma, I still think for him is a dilemma. You know, mm. and I think it came out of not knowing what to call. The project and I kept saying to him, dude, at some point you got to put your fucking name in here, please, you know, because yeah. um, he's never done anything under his own name. That's the other thing, you know. It was De Carols, it was Archipelago, it was uh, Gareth made a blues band, and all the various projects. And it was so it became Gary Herselman and Dilemma. Yeah. 
and what I also do quite like is that idea of having a, a, a sort of a band that isn't a band. Mm. Um, I mean, it's I suppose it's, in it's, a very or, or, weird way, it's, it's the like, Traveling Wilburys. You yeah, know? yeah, or um, it's like the the uh, Sergeant Pepper's Lonely Hearts. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Actually, better example because yeah, yeah no, absolutely. Um, so yeah, um, I mean, the, my whole thing is I get so much pleasure from being around creative people, doing things that I can't do and have no desire to do. But my absolute passion is around music and, and film. And in a sense, whenever there's been any way of kind of bringing those two things together, I've been there. So the music videos I've done, I've done like 40 or 50 music wow. videos. But no one's seen most of them because I've also never done them for big established artists because that to me also doesn't really hold much appeal. Don't get me wrong. Um, you know, if, if somebody wants to come in with a suitcase of cash, I'll make a video for fucking anybody. Yeah. But if I'm going to do it but on you, my you, own... Yeah, you want to do it for the unsung heroes. Yeah, and also if I'm paying for it, why on earth, uh, or, or being paid very little for it, why yeah. on earth would you compromise on who you do it for? You would want to do it for a great artist. I mean, I must tell you, my um, recently I've been blessed that the... the James Phillips film has been recognized and it's yeah. won some awards and all that shit. But before that, the only award I'd ever been nominated for was a Haras Award wow. back in the day. Wow, really? But wait, dude, it's a very long story, but I'll try and keep it short. Yeah. I, I did two we've videos. got a podcast. You can go, man. <laughs> I did two videos for Buck Fever Underground, who I love, for oh, Toast. Wow, and yeah. Okay. And at the time, Toast was uh, teaching uh, English um, over in uh, Korea or somewhere on yeah. the side of the world. So I had to make two videos for them or offered to make two videos for them and none of them could be in the videos which was also kind of a bit weird so I made one for Willem Strikes Back yeah. using my dad as a sort of drunken old codger um, and I did one for a song called Songs for Days that I'm using just Toast Pictures because he's an incredible photographer yeah. which not actually maybe now more people know that than, than about some of his other work but anyway, that was nominated for a Haras Award, and um, I was stuck in Durban, and I said to them, look, please, if I, I, just tell me, do I need to be at this thing or not? Because I'm going to be paying for fucking air tickets. Yeah. And the lady on the end of the phone was like, you have to be there. And I thought, okay, I get well, it. Well, fucking bless so, us all. So, no, no, wait, dude, wait, wait, no, I'm not finished. So I get there. Oh. Then they seat me, and I'm on the aisle. Now, if you watch the Oscars, if you're on the aisle, <laughs> you've won. They put you on the aisle so you don't have to climb over people. Yeah. So literally, they got to the category, and they read it out, and I, like, rocked back in my chair to get up. And the guy two doors down from Disselboom won the fucking video <laughs> award. So that was that. So, oh, uh, yeah. oh so, do, do not um, bless us all. No, so I immediately flew home, and and uh, that was that. But as I said, um, it's yeah, it's all been fine. I don't even know how I got onto that. Oh video. my god! Oh no, the music video thing. Yeah, yeah, just it's always been for artists like that. You got, you know, got, artists I find interesting who, who aren't getting the exposure they deserve. Maybe I can help to some degree. You know? I just want to move through the timeline. Okay, mm. so so let, let's go to the 90s, early 90s. So you, you, you're you traveling with, uh, uh, with Sid Kitchen. Still with Sid, you hang yeah. with them and uh, you, you, you hanged with… Uh, Underground um, Press was still Underground going. Press, yeah. um, they sort of morphed into a band called Scooters Union who were fantastic, who I was a huge fan of. I did a couple of music videos for them. I ended up making a film about them as well. Um, which nobody's really seen. Um, it just kind of never got out there. So I think we had a, a kind of private screening for a couple of people. Yeah. But it's uh, it's the one in the box set that nobody will have ever heard of when I finally bring out my DVD box set. You know. But but but, but you. I mean, you are a compulsive archive yeah no absolutely and i mean the thing is also you know now uh, people are going so like what's the next one and the thing is that there are a bunch that i would love to do but it's getting to a point where um i have to kind of i have to sort of work for a year yeah and live frugally and yeah. keep cash aside to basically bankroll the next one and it's kind of getting to a point where it would be really nice if someone just fucking paid me to do it, you know. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, that's not something you can demand, you know, no, you that happens no. when it does. But, yeah, I, I, I mean, I just – I also find artists fascinating. I mean, one of the other things is I've stopped watching films, films, films. Yeah. I just – can't watch people dressed up pretending to be other people anymore. Like like fictional films. Yeah. Can't do it. Uh, I mean, occasionally if I'm I'm like really bored, I'll I'll watch like the Bourne Supremacy or something, and yeah. just like watch the Skopskit and Donner of it and have a jaw, you know. But I just struggle with drama. 
Yeah. And I love documentaries and I watch a shitload of documentaries. And it's got to a point now where I've realized that a well-made film about an interesting person is a great film. Yeah. Simple as that. Yeah. So if you say to me, um, funny enough, Jonathan mentioned a thing to me. They were playing up at a place called the Green Lantern up in uh, near Harry Smith, yeah. uh, Van Rienens, a little hotel there. They did a show. There was a guy in the audience. He was a bank robber. In the 60s, they robbed a bank, 250 grand they got away with then in the 60s. You can imagine how much money that was. And he was in the crowd? He was in the crowd and in the bar afterwards. There's a donkey there as well in the bar, but that's another story, I guess. And anyway, so he started telling Jonathan some of his story. And again, like to me, immediately, my immediate reaction is like, that's a fucking film right there. That's a donkey right this there. This guy, you go interview him in the bar with the donkey telling you about their inside man during the robbery and how they got the 250 grand and then who turned state. They were going to hang these guys. They got the death penalty because they were. it was an armed robbery. And in those days, 60s or whenever it was, it was it was a big deal. So, yeah, to illustrate the point yeah. is, is I would like to make a film about Anki Kroch. I'd like to make a film about, uh, you know, um, Walter Mayer. Yeah. Uh, you know, these kind of people. Anyone who's... Um, an artist I find inherently interesting. Did Some you, of them, when you get a little closer, you realize there's nobody home. Um, there are two very prominent South African musicians who shall remain nameless, yeah, I know, who are I, interviewed I, yeah. for the, the James Phillips film and who are not in the film because they were oh, okay. dull. And I won't name them, but they were dull. They had nothing interesting to say, and, and I don't regret talking to them, but they just they didn't make it. Yeah. So it's not a given that anyone you talk to who happens to be a, a creative person is going to be compelling television. But that being said, um, there are a lot of really interesting people out there that people don't know about. And, and it's great to shine a light on someone like that. And if their work is good, it'll stand. Yeah. So you can make a film about someone like James Phillips, who some people remember passionately, some people have no idea of. Mm. And what's been cool is having young people watch the film and be totally uh, absorbed and blown away by the music. Because at the end of the day, that's the star of the show, yeah. is the, what the guy left. And that's the stuff you want to shine a light on and give another, you know, I mean, I'm jumping around no, um, cool. uh, with this. I'm picturing James Phillips. I mean, when was the first time that you? I mean, you you made you made the documentary about the Radio Rats as well, and I wanna we can we can speak about your relationship with with that band as well. But with James Phillips, where did you realize or, or when it, when it, well, when did he get onto your radar? Well, what was interesting, and I mean, a few people have asked because now the movie's done a couple of festivals and stuff, and you know the Q and A's are all kind of so you must have been really close. And what mm. was interesting is that. I knew James, I uh, saw him uh, perform, um, I saw the Full Freight Tour when it came through Durban, I saw the Lurches at Jamison's, so... I, s stop right yeah. there, you saw the Full Freight Tour come to Durban. Yeah, yeah. Did you witness the whole... The whole, the whole shebang, and by that stage, um, I, I knew Gary yeah. at that point, because um, the Sid Kitchen album was stocked by Hillbrow Records, and when the utensils played at Jamison's, the carols opened for us. So I knew Gary reasonably well. Yeah. Um, so he didn't give me a comp or anything, but I just <laughs> let it pay. But um, I went with a couple of mates, and it, it was, it was mind-boggling. It was genuinely, I'd never seen anything like that. And what was amazing to me was that there were these guys, um, and my mother was a, a retief. Her, my gran was a retief. My mother was a, a short. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm, I've am i always loved Afrikaans as a language. Yeah. My grandmother, my maternal grandmother spoke Afrikaans. Um, so it wasn't a case of, of watching these guys singing in Afrikaans and not getting it. I totally got it. I knew what they were singing, and it was mind-boggling to me. Um, and it was a great show. I mean, it was interesting also how the show was structured because Kurs opened. Yeah, because he was so yeah. Young. Was he under the toy at that stage, or was he? He was already Kuskumbase. Actually, Kumbais. no, he was Kuskumbase. Eh? Uh, actually, wait, I could be wrong on that. So let me just, yeah, I think he was Kurs already then. But from the Hopkins book, I remember you were. Yeah. It was like him but solo. He was, yeah, yeah, no, it was definitely him solo. And then obviously um, James was there with a the Swat Gafar, so it was yeah. an oldest Newman and his Swat Gafar, and. Gary was part of the sort of headline act, so Gary didn't play with with James, yeah. but Willem did, and of course Willem has always been a, a remarkable musician. So I remember watching that show and going, first of all, I'd seen the Lurches before, so this was like a huge 
kind of changed from what the Lurch's stuff was. Because what a lot of people don't know is that Full Frey basically killed the Lurch's. Yeah. So the Lurch's was a mid-80s thing, um, you know, Jamison's, very much based at Jamison's. Um, and then when the East Afrikaans rock concert happened, which I think is 88, I could be wrong, um, very soon after that, Full Frey took off. And basically the Lurches were put to bed, and it was now Benal de Siniswat <laughs> Kafar. Yeah. So um, I was familiar with James then. I also booked James and the Lurches to play in Durban. I was wow. involved with a little club there for a few months um, booking acts. Um, so, and I remember funny enough booking him also, I was, I was young, man. I was like, yeah, maybe 19, 20. And I remember him not being hugely impressed with this lighty, you know, telling him what time to be at the venue and, you know, sound check will be at four and this kind of stuff. And I must've looked like a precocious little twat, you know? And, um, so James was never hugely friendly to me or, yeah. or anything, um, but I had absolutely no doubt about just how great he was. And, and I mean, I think that's the other thing is it's quite cool making the film with where there is a history, but that that history doesn't cloud anything. Of course, yeah. Because I think it would be very difficult. Funny enough, a guy made a film about Sid, which I didn't particularly like. And a few people have said, but shit, you know, you should have made the Sid film. You, yeah. know, you had this. But I had such a close relationship to him. I don't know that that is the right film for me to make on yeah. some level. It'd be like kind of trying to write a book about your dad, you know. Yeah. I mean, it's you, you're too, of, too close to be objective yeah. almost. Yeah. And the nice thing with the, the James film is, is kind of also being very well aware of his incredible strengths and his weaknesses and his kind of the duality of the guy. So that. Uh, in a way I think is a good thing that I knew him and I respected him I saw him at the heart of his powers yeah. but I also wasn't blind to some of his failings and at the end of the day if you want the film or a film or a book or an autobiography to, to genuinely resonate you kind of you have to be honest you know you can choose to really focus on something and focus slightly less on something else but you can't actually bury stuff and just you know leave out large chunks of someone's life or it's um, it's not uh, representative. You but know? how did that full flash show in Durban go down? Well, there was there's a wonderful story about how the venue had happened, and was that um, and you got to give Dacher Dirk credit for this is that he phoned all these places, but he kind of sold them all on this kind of cultural evening. Yeah, you know, there's going to be this like evening of culture, Afrikaans <laughs> cultural music. It's you good know, PR. <laughs> and um, yeah, it was at the Central Methodist Church, and they shat themselves. I mean, they were they were horrified. And funnily enough, I actually met the guy that Dachet de conned into letting this thing happen years later, and I just couldn't bring myself to go like, so you're the dude. But yeah, no, it was it was amazing. I mean, it was well attended. You know, it was great sound. It was a good show, and it was sort of in the middle of the tour. Yeah. Because, you know, the end of the tour got messy and the beginning of the tour, I think, was relatively chaotic, as you can imagine. Yeah. Um, I could be wrong on the beginning part, but I know the end was messy. So, you know, I think it was at a cool point and, you know, people were firing and the guys were playing really well. And it was quite a it was quite a thing. I mean, I remember it also visually. It was quite there was some sort of quite surreal shit. You know, there would be like a big plastic crayfish, you know, the Yet Kreef thing yeah. before the album before I was aware of the album, yeah. it'd be a big like crayfish on a mic stand, and you know all these like weird things, you know, like sort of ox wagon backdrop, and they were, it was amazing. It was quite a it was quite a surreal thing, but the quality was there too. You know, these guys could all play. Yeah, maybe because not so much as everyone else, <laughs> but um, but I mean, he also had a, an incredible charm. I mean, that Fefani O'Kalahari thing is something else to listen yeah. to still. I mean, and, it's and amazingly they, intimate they, as well. They, you they, know? they kept in the sniffles. Yes, know? yeah, because yeah, he was he was sick. You yeah, know? yeah. He, he had the flu. Yeah, uh, and, and uh, okay, so that's right. It's so, not sick though. Yeah, yeah and, and it's, but it's amazing that you saw that. You know, because I mean, there's there's only one or two sources who wrote about that, and there's a lot and there's a lot of internal politics about what really happened yeah. went down there. But for making the film, I mean, you were aware that James Phillips was doing something totally different yeah. from which he came from, you know? I do. I did also hear the Benaldus Niemand album when it came out. And I remember um, I had a friend who, who had it and, and who played it to me. And I mean, I remember at the time being quite, like, uh, confused by the, the fact that every song is essentially a different genre. Yeah. Um, 
again, the mixing up of the language, um, because reggae vibes is cool. There's obviously some English in there as well. And, and, and you, you know what happened on that song? Um, that was the first tweet that Rolling Stones at Africa magazine tweeted. How do I live in this strange place? Oh, really? That was the first tweet no way, that, so. that Rolling Stones at Africa made. And we, ah. we always, when, when, when shit was going bad yeah. in Rolling Stone offices, we would put on that song for some other reason. Why didn't someone fucking make this film years ago because he's, he's, he he's still has a presence in the South African music oh, yeah. industry. He's got, he's got a fucking staged opi copy at, sure. at Steak and Ale. There was a backdrop of that painting of him when he played at Steak and Ale and Steak and Ale fucking burned down. I mean, he still has, his ghost is still here. You sure. know, he's still, he's still relevant. You know, I think, I mean, Kurt says a thing in the film which I think is really interesting and I mean, he draws this kind of line and you can actually take it even back one step further. And, and funny enough, it's where the Radio Rats come in, is that James was a huge Radio Rats fan, yeah. absolutely huge fan. He's in the film on camera going, the lyrics to Into the Night We Slide, which was the first Rats album, are the best lyrics he's ever heard to any uh, for any album anywhere. So he was hugely inspired by them, absolutely no doubt. So to me, the line goes, Radio Rats, without the Rats, you don't have James. Without James, you don't have Kuss. You don't have Cac Oral. You don't have the GBB. And those guys, none of them deny that. And in the film, all of them say it. Yeah. So you've got Rolf in the film going, I heard Home A Fuss and it blew me away. You've got Cac Oral, I mean, you've got Kuss going, when I heard this guy, I realized I could do this, you know? Um, so there's this, and, and that, of course, leads to, Everyone from you to Francois to the to fucking Oppie, you know, all of that stuff is. Fuck, I'm getting chills. Why? Why are you saying actually, that? Actually, the other thing I must stop doing is saying Oppie because it's been pointed out to me. If it's anything, say it's fucking always, copy. It's always Don't a, say it's, Oppie. It's always a SOT who says Oppie. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> Our drummer is a SOT as well. No, so really. Are we going to Oppie, Oppie next year? Yeah, I'm like, yeah. no, we're going to fucking copy. Yeah, the copy, yeah. <laughs> No, but that, that line is absolutely yeah. there. And he's, the, he's, he's a very important spark. And I think if you take any one of those things out of it, it doesn't, you know, the, the things would have turned out differently and not particularly well. <laughs> so, you know, without James, you don't have those things. And, I mean, I think that's also, you know, what people forget that James was on the Full Freight Tour totally uh, out of respect for what he had started. Yeah. So he was he was kind of the odd one out in many respects on that tour because at that point, Kurs and, and Rolf were, uh, and Kerkoral were like the, the sort of darlings. Yeah. Um, and very quickly got to a point where there was huge admiration and respect, and, and the crowds were there to see them. The crowds weren't there to see Bernaldus. Yeah. And, I mean, that might not be a cool thing to um, for people to hear, but it's the truth, is that he was there because everybody else knew that without him the, the whole thing wouldn't exist. Yeah, and the thing is, th th that was one of his musical phases. Oh, yeah, and, I mean, that's the other thing, you know, um, we we interviewed Jack Perro for the film and shit. He, you know, his interview was actually fucking great. Um, I I'm, I'm was quite awed at just how he's a smart fella. He really is. Jack Perro's no fool. And he pointed out an interesting thing where he kind of basically said, you know, if James had just kept on being Bernaldus, he would have probably been fine. But he didn't want to stay that guy. It yeah. was a, it was a project for him. It was a thing. It was a yeah. concept album in every respect. It's like you know, Ziggy just, Stardust. You know, yeah, you, you can't stay Ziggy Stardust forever. Look, I mean, Bowie killed off five different characters. Mm. Really, you, know, you got the Thin White Duke. You got all these things. You know, there's there's these various phases, and and of course, if you're hugely successful, nobody questions that. But if you're not hugely successful. They literally will walk to the front of the stage going like, why aren't you playing that stuff from before? What's this new shit? Yeah. You know? Play the hits. And remember with, with James, you've got, you know, he starts out with Corporal Punishment, which are basically, I mean, everyone calls them a punk band. It's kind of not really that simple. There's, but essentially they're fucking loud and they were young. And With Carl Ro Robinheimer. You're with Carl Robinheimer, who's another whole story altogether. He's also a huge talent. So you've got that. And then you've got the Lurchers, okay? Um, and at the same time, you've got Bernaldus going on. Then you've got Full Frey. Then you've got the solo stuff. Then you've got this jazz album. And the last thing that James was working on was stuff for Kentridge with Warwick Sony, which is like seriously kind of creative music for film and theater and stuff like that. And, and you know, he was also classically trained. So there's no reason why 
as as um, Sean Duvall from Mail and Guardian says in the film, you know, he probably right now he would have been if he was still around, he'd be writing his fourth symphony. Yeah. You know? So this is a guy who never stood still. And I think that's the other thing is the temptation, and that's why I brought up Perro, is that I think he made a good point, which is that there's a, a kind of a temptation to keep being that guy that they all loved. Yeah. So whoever the character and he, was... And he wasn't in that kind of game. No. He was someone who was going to be who he wanted to be on his own terms when he wanted to do it. There was no question about compromising on what he wanted to do musically. Okay, okay but now, Michael, you telling me all this details about James, did you... Did you know this and you wanted to show people this or did you no. or did, did you find this out no, while look, making this film? I think the the cool thing with with um a documentary and I mean again to me there's no real sort of mystery around how you do it. You obviously try and talk to as many people as you can who were there or who knew someone and and they will all give you different stories but there'll be enough common ground mm. in what they say if you to realize that that stuff means something. So yeah. if you interview I think I maybe did like 30 interviews for the film and maybe 25 of those people are, are in the film. And some of them are not in the film for very long, but they say something that's really important. Yeah. But people start to say the same stuff and you go, well, hang on a second. They, the, multiple people are telling me that. Yeah. That means that something. That resonates, yeah. Exactly. And there'll be other people who'll tell you some sort of interesting little anecdote, which if you're going to go Ken Burns and make an eight-hour film, you can put in there, but you can't if you've got to try and keep it under 100 minutes. So um, I, I think what I knew was that there was this amazing body of work. Look, Shut Down is still... Fuck, it's a beautiful it's song. It's probably the best rock song r ever written by a South African artist, in my mind. And I'm sorry, it knocks weeping into a cocked hat. It really does. Um I mean, I think it's, I really do think that. Um, so, you know, it's kind of not hard to go, well, this is a guy who's who's written some great songs. And then I thought, well, hang on, let me re-examine the, the body of work. And I realized how his early stuff, I didn't know as well as I should. And I went back and listened to the Corporal Punishment stuff, listened to Illegal Gathering also with Carl. And it, there's some amazing material there. I mean, the Billy Smith thing is, yeah. is, is, is obviously from the Illegal Gathering album. Uh, Home A Fuss is originally an illegal gathering tune. It's on the illegal gathering cassette. So it just was abundantly clear that this guy had this incredible body of work. So you go, okay, who can I talk to? You find enough people to talk about it, and you get the truth of who that person is. And you then get to choose what you tell people and what you don't. So there wasn't a narrative, and I must just, no. that's the other thing. I don't do narration. There's no narration yeah. in any of my films. I fucking hate it. So same with the Rats film, Rockstardom, all of those. There's no voice that it's comes It's just talking in. heads, yeah. It's them talking and as much as possible the person themselves. Because and the music, for me, yeah. yeah, and as much music as you can cram in. I think there are 52 pieces of music in the James Phillips what film. I, what I liked about the, about the documentary was uh, the fact that you, would, that you would give the text on the lyrics so that you can read the lyrics. Yeah, I think sometimes it's, I think it's important. I mean, it's not, obviously not something um, that you can or necessarily should always do. But no, I think no, but, if but, you but, do but, it in certain no. places, it, it kind of reminds you that it's not just about the song. I mean, what he's actually saying is so powerful and no. so important. So, yeah, I mean, and, it's... And because of his characters, if, I mean, if, if he's singing in the Bernoldes Niemand vernacular, then that's a, that's, that's a very specific accent as well. You know, yeah, that, yeah, that's absolutely. A, that's a character that, 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 no, that, is, exactly. that is channeling. And it's cool that you give the lyrics on there. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think the thing was, <coughs> what was clear to me was that this is a guy who should be known by everybody. I mean, he really should be as well known as any South African musician across the board. And that applies to kids in school should be literally should be learning about this guy. That's how important he is. While I was watching the documentary, a lot of the footage uh, looked very similar. It looked like it was shot in a similar time when you were doing the Radio Rats. When, yeah. Just give me some technical, like a, a time scope, because you, you did some of those interviews, man, Quiscom Bass, that looks like 15 years ago. Yeah, when, some when of that stuff him. is a long time ago. Um, I mean, I Which started, is cool because... Yeah. Yeah. Uh, look, I mean, I started shooting stuff, I guess, in the mid-80s. So, for example, with the Radio Rats film, the first bit of video in that film that I actually shot, I shot in 91, which was wow. a live gig of theirs. So I used to joke about the Radio Rats film, and it 
going, you know, it was 25 years in the making because technically it was, you know, from the first <laughs> shot to the film actually coming out in 2016. You, you, you can close that door for you, Cole. No, huh? no, no, dude. I just, um, so, yeah, um, I, I used to shoot a lot of stuff. And in those days, I was shooting on a, a VHS camcorder. Yeah. So I'd literally take a full-size VHS tape. Um, and, I mean, the quality was dreadful. But the, the thing is also I, I really love – good archive and it's yeah. really hard to find but if you get it right it absolutely captures an, an era and and i think that's also one of the areas where it would be nice one day to have kind of proper time and money and things to do these things well yeah i mean the other thing that struck me also is is there's not a huge amount of footage of some of these people precisely so you know if you go and make a film let's say about uh Perro or about francois or whatever you know, Francois's first gig was shot by his parents as a seven-year-old, you know, singing in a school play or something. So just because of the time frame, yeah. everybody had cameras. If you make a film about an artist who's kind of coming out now, you're going to have no limit in terms of access to material. Yeah. I bet you if you would interview Quiscom Base now, you would say probably – Something totally different that, that he would have said yeah. 15 years ago. And I mean, it was also interesting because with some of the interviews, um, <laughs> there was this sort of uh, people were emotional. Um, yeah. But I had this approach to it, which is like, again, really obvious. So this is no state secret. But, 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 but by being chronological, you were never – Starting your interview going, geez, you must really miss the dude, you know, or yeah. uh, how, how did you feel when he died stuff. Yeah. You know, you've gone through every stage of his career where those people were a part of it, and you've ended up in that place. So when the emotion is there, it's it's genuine. And when you're talking about the kind of good old days or, or, or reminiscing about the early stage of his career, that is not clouded by – Jesus must have been really cuck when yeah. he died. So people can kind of talk in a in a different way and be quite open. I must tell you also the one thing about the film that I'm really grateful about is is his family's support. Yeah. Because his mom came to see the Radio Rats film in Joburg and she actually was one of the prime movers where she was going, you know, thank you so much for reminding people about Jamie um, oh, and sure, all of that. Man. And um and I mean she's been my lucky charm. She came to the premiere in Joburg, Cape Town, Durban. She came to Opi to watch the film. To she came to <laughs> Oh God, yes, yeah, sorry, yeah, yeah, shit. <laughs> she also came down to Grahamstown. So I've sort of joked with her and said, you know, she's my lucky charm. If she's not there, I always think like the screening's gonna go badly. When when you were doing those interviews, I mean how long ago was that that those interviews with uh because you, you can see Jonathan Hanley is, is also oh, yeah, yeah. in the no, same no, some time frame. No, no, no. Some of the interviews are, are interviews that were done by other people yeah. um, at the time of his passing and yeah. after. Um, but the the vast majority of the interviews were done now. Okay. So the the only interviews from then really are Jonathan. Um, Kuss. Kuss. It was, it was a Carcoral interview. Yeah, there's a cackerel thing from the concert uh, after he died. Yeah, and you know the thing is also there's a there's a wealth of material that is kind of relevant but not necessarily um, that you can't use because again there's this whole thing of trying to make it manageable. <laughs> yeah, um, and I really struggled to get the film down. Um, you know, I had this whole thing, I'm never going to make a film over 100 minutes again because at literally 100 minutes, people start fidgeting and yeah. people's bladders start to give them trouble. And and this is like 99 minutes and 30 seconds. So it's <laughs> just, it just creeps in, you know. Um, but, um, yeah, no, there was just a huge amount of material. And uh, what was cool was the main interview with James in the film was an interview that no one had seen before. So there were bits of the film that had been seen in other things that other people had made. Robbie Thorpe and Lloyd made a film called Famous for Not Being Famous. Yes. Uh, I'm trying to think of what year that would have been, at least 10 years ago. Um, but, uh, yeah, the, the main interview with James was one that no one had seen, and that interview is the absolute um, kind of Who did that interview? Bedrock. Um, a guy called Ken Kaplan, who's someone oh. I've known for many years, he did the interview shortly after Full Fray. Yeah. Um, but I've seen other interviews with James. In fact, some other bits uh, of James weren't used in the film because of how good that interview was. Oh. So that really is the one where he thoroughly explores the Bernaldus thing. He talks about the 
difficulty of being on the full freight tour, but yeah. it not being where his heart really was in many respects in terms of he had other music going on. Um, him too, he talks about the army then. Um, so it, it's a really, really solid interview. And I think that was kind of also quite a big part of, of how the film came to be is the moment that I got that interview, it was like, shit, this is half an hour of James talking. And that's yeah. what, uh, you know, almost everything he says in that film is either from two radio interviews which is obviously when you don't see him or when you see him sitting with that full frame poster behind him yeah. and, and talking. Yeah. That, that's, a, yeah, that's a very iconic uh, um, uh, him sitting in front of that full frame poster. Yeah. For, for you who made the documentary, were, were there some gaps or something that if you could have interviewed him, would have wanted to ask yeah, him? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think I would have liked to have tried to explore the the stuff that he didn't really talk about and i mean there were times that where his life was very clearly was very tough you mm. know he had very little materially speaking and um there wasn't a huge amount of interest in what he was doing um from certainly from radio and the media generally so i kind of would have liked to have maybe known a bit more about how that felt Oh. But again, talking to people who knew him well and talking about the disappointment he felt with the last album and the sort of response it got, which was the big jazz album, which has oh. got ridiculous players on it, and it's a great record. Um, it didn't get any significant media, really. I gave it a nice review, but <laughs> nobody read it because they were busy checking out the centerfold and the scope <laughs> issue that it came out with, particularly you, by the sound of it. I remember my dad reading that magazine and telling my mom, no, but... but the uh, articles are great. No, it's uh, great writers, great Funny journalism. Enough, um, actually, they, they, I have to give them some credit, though, because I, I don't know if you know, the um, Playboy uh, had this amazing thing where they really did have great writers. Oh. Um, and the last Lennon interview before he was killed was a Playboy interview. Interview. Um, and it was released as a book, which my dad gave me when I was quite young. Wow. Um, and it was a really amazing interview. It's one of the ones where he sort of talks about how much joy he got out of baking bread. He used to love wow. making bread. And it was when he was living in the Dakota building, literally in the sort of weeks before he was killed. So there is something to be said for these magazines did actually have some good articles. Yeah, but of course. Uh, they also had babes, <laughs> stars on their breasts, you know. Yeah. Uh, so you make this film. And the thing is, you're an independent filmmaker. Yeah. So, uh, do you ever source for fu for external funding? I mean, because you submit these films to all these film festivals. I mean, you won awards. What awards did you win for this film? No, look, it's been really well received. I mean, it won uh, a Simon Sabella Award, which is uh, the big uh, KZN Film Commission Award. It oh. won the Audience Award in Counters. It, it's been doing really well. Um, you know, and people have been... Amazing. It, it recently won a, 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 an award, a Best in Fest, for a, a music film festival, which is secretly like the, the award that kind of matters the most because it's just music documentaries, yeah. which, as I said, is my kind of passion. I watch a shitload of them as well. So it was like I'd seen half the other films and thought, shit, there's some stiff competition. But, yeah, um, you know, I, I heard a thing about Scorsese years ago that I thought was really amazing, where he basically says he does one for the studios and one for himself. Oh, uh, yeah. So basically he will make some huge film with a massive budget for Miramax or the late Miramax or whatever, and then he'll make, you know, the that, terminal with Tom Hanks as yeah. the dude in an airport. You know, Oil the, maker that uh, George Harrison bought. Yeah, yeah, Fuck, yeah, 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 absolutely. And I mean, uh, and it's a great film. Yeah. So I kind of, um, the comparisons in there, trust me. Um, but yeah, I thought there was something amazing about that of kind of, you know, get people to pay you to do work you don't necessarily desperately no. want to do to pay the bills and then for god's sake take some of that money and put it into the project that no one's given you money to make and my hope still is that eventually um i will get funding up front to make no. a film based on the success of the previous one no. um and you know these things have kind of built you know the rats film was very well received and and things and this has been better received so one kind of hopes there's a a trajectory of sorts and, and that, you know, the next one will be even better received. But the thing is, uh, fuck the reception, you know, because <laughs> the stories are so amazing and it's, it's, it's one of these things that I'm so glad somebody did it, you know? Yeah. I mean, it's the same with the Radio Rat story because I grew up with that music in my house. My dad listened to that. I never knew the Radio Rats, uh, the, sure. the story, you know? And because of that film, it just fucking... It brings that band to life again. Yeah, you know? I mean, I think I think on some level, um, it's kind of important 
for people to be reminded mm. um, who some of these people are in terms of people who are not around anymore. And in the case of, of, of new artists uh, or, or sort of relatively recent artists, of getting to understand something beyond what you see. Because if you think about it, um, even in the days of vinyl, you were getting a hell of a lot more information about an artist. As much as the internet's there and all that stuff, yeah. if you bought a, a, a an album, you know, let's say you bought, you know, one of the Zep albums or whatever, there was such a rich kind of, you, you know, you would open it, you'd smell the bloody thing, you would open yeah. it up, you'd have this album art that was the size, you know, twelve inches across. This big thing. You would, yeah, exactly. You, you would you would have the line even notes, even no. the C, uh, even a CD. I mean, I'm a huge fan of people who make an effort with their packaging of their CDs. And again, credit to you for this one, dude, because you've done a great job with some of yours as well. Where you, you know, you're going away from a straight jewel case and you're no. trying to do something interesting. But I mean, even a CD was a huge step back from what you could get out of a, 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 an LP no. in terms of cover art. And of course now. You know, it's gone down to a thumbnail, yeah. um, and 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 so, in a sense, you know, as much as music has become so much more available, I think the kind of what's behind that music yeah. is is less there. I mean, I used to go to CNA every week and get the new Musical Express, the enemy, yeah. which you could get at CNA in Durban. It'd be a couple of weeks late, but every week it was there. And read it cover to cover because it was information about other artists you'd never heard of and may never have heard of, no. never hear, I mean. Or it was just giving you that little bit extra that suddenly made that stuff resonate more and mean more to you. I worked for a magazine called The Rolling Stone and I just pulled out a copy here. <laughs> and uh, There's my son. And your son, his name is James. He is indeed. It's and one he, of my two, and, yeah. And, and he played for a band or plays for a band or played for a band called Fruit and Veggies. Yeah. And this is quite a fucking rock and roll article about It is about quite them. a rock and roll article. <laughs> they were pretty fucking rock and roll. So that's your son. Okay, so that... Well, this, two, that, of that my, that's <laughs> two of my kids are, are very yeah. musical. Um, my sons, James and Bobby, both play. Bobby's in a punk band that's doing really well in the UK at the moment um, and my um, son's now in the film industry and my daughter's uh, recently been given a whole lot of funding to make a documentary about wild dogs so wow you've, you've got three kids i got four, um, four and the wow. other ones in the uk doing swimmingly as well so yeah no, um, overactive loins back in the day but but, um, okay, but so so those 80s while you were studying and hanging with Sid kitchen no no dude that all started a lot later eh? is um, it 90s? Yeah, no, 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 yeah, 90s so how old's yeah. james now james is now uh, mid-20s eh? mid-20s so, fuck he must have been young here yeah, yeah, it was like nineteen, twenty, probably. Fuck, and this, yeah. is, this is this is quite a raunchy band. No, eh? dude, they were seriously rock and roll. Eh? I mean, I, um, <laughs> I mean, I actually. Uh, what, did, what, what did you think when you when you well, read I mean, this I article? Sort of, I kind of tried to get involved at one point and sort of steer them and you know help them a little in the studio and stuff, but they. No, totally unmanageable. You got to you know, pick your battles. You know, <laughs> I'd rather deal with some old codger who you've got to jumpstart with a you know kind of every now and then. Yeah, but I mean, are, so. I mean, you opening uh, a. A Rolling Stone magazine with Bob Dylan on the cover, and there's I couldn't full have been, full page pictures of your I of your boy. I could not have been here. more proud, and I must tell you, also, it, it's a great article written by Roger Young. It's great yeah. pictures by Kevin Goss Ross, who's great a fantastic pictures, yeah. photographer. So yeah, it was amazing, and um, some of the pictures are from Copy, yeah, Ni Opi. <laughs> um, yeah, it was great, and I, I sort of uh, yeah, I, I kind of I envy their musical ability because, as I said, that's not something I've ever had, and the yeah you know, old dogs new tricks eh? um there's an age where it is too late to actually pick up a but, guitar but but i mean I um being a documentarian and seeing what bands did and now your light is 19 or 20 yeah. what went through your mind seeing him in pop culture you know no uh, no it's it's i mean it's cool again you know my my feeling is that the, the real tragedy of people who go through their whole life working their asses off and and nobody knows they were there yeah and at the end of the day, I mean, James is on the Rechtenberg album on one of the tracks with his band called The Trees, yeah. you know. So it's it's that kind of thing of it's it's really cool to see people leave something behind. And I think that's so important. If you are totally – if you have no interest in that, that's also cool. Yeah. But I think the real frustration is that there are people who wish they could do that and just never kind of get it together. Yeah. If you want to paint, you should fucking paint. And maybe somebody will like that painting enough that they might not even pay you for it, but they might put it on their wall. And oh. that's cool. You know, <laughs> if you've got a story to tell, you should write it. Um, 
yeah, I just I think I think everybody's kind of got something to say, and we are usually get that shit beaten out of you pretty young. Um, yeah. I used to paint when I was a kid, and I loved it. Uh, my mom was a, a really good painter, and we used to paint together. And I'm talking primary school, and I got to high school, and they basically went, "Your marks are way too good for you to be painting." Yeah. So you need to do history, geography, math, science, English, Afrikaans, which was like the sort of, if you... That was your staple, did, yeah. Yeah, and I mean, I actually think about it now, and that's probably my, the thing I'm most angry about, apart from all the times they caned me, was, <laughs> was for that. Is that like, what bullshit is that? That you, you, you're too smart to paint. What the fuck is that about? You know, and literally, I mean, it, it, it makes me angry that there was a kid, in this case me, who wanted to do that and could have done it and was doing okay at it, and wanted to do it and was basically told, like, nah, that's not for you. And it's because the school and the time, this would have been late 70s, early 80s, you know, I was at a school who's, you know, the heroes of that school were the first team rugby players and the first team cricket players. And even the cricket players were kind of slightly frowned on because they weren't rugby players. But any kind of creative thing was, I mean, I don't remember there being dramatics. I don't remember no. there being a choir even. There might have been. You know, it was just that art stuff is. You Did know? your dad and your and, and your mom ever see some of your films? Oh hell yes, yeah, yeah, no, no, they've and been what, what, hugely what they supportive. About, yeah. um, <laughs> they've they've been they've actually been quite amazing because my my dad is is always kind of managed to find at least one thing that he can kind of constructively criticize. Yeah. <laughs> um, my mom was always much more, uh, sadly she's not around anymore to see this because I would have loved her to have seen it because as I said, she's the sort of Afrikaans part of the family yeah. so I think this would have resonated somehow. But uh, yeah, he always managed to find some sort of, uh, something that could have possibly been re-evaluated. But, um, know, but uh, did, did there have been see, less yeah. and less of those as they've gone on and the, this one he was like, great job and that, that means a lot. Eh? Um, he's a smart guy, you know. So, and so some of the other critiques? Um, yeah, sort of, you know, kind of maybe it's flagging at that point, and you know, maybe you should consider. <laughs> and unfortunately, so get, a, get a blog, Dad. Yeah, Jesus exactly. Christ. Yeah, 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 absolutely. <laughs> but I mean, I must say, I think the the thing that I'm most grateful for is that it I was encouraged without being flattered, you know, oh. um, because it's I think flattery is very dangerous for kids. Um, you know, uh, the George Carlin is this comedian I'm very fond of. I love George uh, Carlin. George Carlin had a wonderful thing where he said, you know, not all kids are fucking remarkable. There's some <laughs> seriously average kids out there, you know, kind of like. I also heard a lovely one again where they said, well, if someone shows you a picture of their child on your phone, you must say, nice phone. <laughs> so also thought, yeah. No, so I mean, um, but seriously, I think, you know, you got if you flatter kids. I mean, I mean, I, I, you know, my boys are both, as I said, I think have have got a lot of talent musically, and it's it's a it's something that they've haven't had to necessarily work incredibly hard to have. I think they're no. naturally gifted, and there's nothing wrong with saying to someone, "You're very lucky to have that gift, and you no. shouldn't take it lightly, and you should do something with it." You know, but um, yeah, uh, I think I was encouraged, but not flattered, and that's yeah. maybe a a good thing, you know. So he he, he was still um, he was still modest about. What you what, what what you were doing your dad? Yeah, I mean, I, I I must say I still struggle on some level when like I don't really know necessarily how you always reply to someone who goes like fuck that was great. It was mm. like it 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 feels weird going like yeah well you know <laughs> it is pretty great. And also of you know it is. <laughs> yeah, and also if you do the kind of like no 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 I mean it also ends up sounding no, like no, you're, you're an asshole. The, so the, it's the thing best, is, uh, you just got to go like thank you thank that, you so much thank stuff, you you know thank and, you very and much. it is. Yes. You know, the other thing is also um, uh, that I would say to anyone who encounters anyone <laughs> doing something creative that they enjoy is, for fuck's sake, do tell them. Yeah. Because Fucking it's, do tell it's, them. Yeah, it's a, it's a hard mountain to climb. You know, Jonathan always said this thing about being in the music industry is like dragging a piano up a mountain, tearing up money. Um, <laughs> and I think the film business is not that different. You yeah. know, it's hard and, and it takes time. But the know? thing is, while, I mean, while you were not, I mean, is being a full, you're not a full time documentarian your whole life. I mean, no, I sort of, kind of am now because what usually, as I said, pays the bills is is other documentary work. Uh, so I do stuff with CNN and um, wow, yeah, which is great. And I mean, you know, as I said, it, it's it's sort of those are the things that if if I do that, it, it gives me a little bit of time to do something that I, I yeah. want to do. Oh yeah, so so you, you worked you work towards a spot where you go, okay, cool. Now I can do a bit of my own stuff. Oh, that's and I must cool. tell you that James film is also the product of a very very bad year f for me in terms of business. Yeah. 
um, last year was was a terrible year, so I was really quiet. Um, and you know, the th- other thing, sadly, is staring at a phone doesn't make it ring in yeah. the same way as a watched kettle doesn't, apparently. But yeah, so I mean, I also refuse to do nothing if I have nothing to do, because I think that's an incredibly negative thing. You yeah. know? Um, me you smoke a lot of weed and watch Cartoon Network all day or whatever. <laughs> so the logical thing to do is to kind of sink your teeth into something that is for you, yeah. that holds your attention, and that you can spend time. And I mean, I cut that film more or less every day for a year. You know, it's a it's a shitload of work um, because there was a lot of material. And if there'd been less material, um, it would have been quicker. The thing is, I can relate a little bit more than the average person because um, I was commissioned to do a little. Um, like a behind the scenes kind of video for a private New Year's festival in Fleas by for, for like for the past eight, nine years. And this thing quickly spiraled into a small little doc- yeah. documentary. And I- I'm going to tell you, it, that was the hardest I've ever worked in my fucking life. Yeah. And, 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 there's, and there's so many expectations. And uh, I basically, there's a little MacBook Pro there. And, and because of that form, that thing is fried. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it does and put be, some be, strain, eh? You quickly realize, oh, fuck, I have to profile this thing on Pitbueta. Oh, my God, he's got so many albums out. Okay, there's Akadis. They've got this whole history. Mm. Oh, there's this band. Oh, there's Derek. There's all these guys that, that's part of this festival. You, you have to explain and show them who these people are, and it's a big yeah. responsibility. You know, the thing, I, I kind of tried to explain it to somebody once. I had a chance just recently to talk to some like young filmmakers thing where it still feels very strange when you kind of somehow… Like a James Lipton kind of thing. Yeah, a little bit, you know. Where you, but on some level, you kind of don't actually think you're old enough to do that, which I clearly am. I'm on the wrong side of fucking 50. I'm not a kid anymore. But it was great talking to them and going, you know, because a lot of them were fascinated by how you structure and cut a long form. You know, mm. So if you're looking at like 100 minutes and, and it, you know, you find yourself saying what you believe and it sounds so incredibly unclever, you know. So it's like, well… You know, you want to start strong, and, uh, and if you've got that bit you like for the end, you, you know, put it at the end, and, and then there's the middle, you know, where you put everything else. And, but I, I get a the, the one thing I do do, which I would recommend to anyone, particularly if music's a part of what you do, is is edit with a music track underneath, yeah, even if it's a temp music track. And I didn't know this when I started working, and then I I worked for a couple of years for a, a sort of fairly big film company, and. Um, well, at the time, the biggest film company in, in South Africa. And one of the things that we would do is that we would sometimes work with temporary music. Yeah. So you would basically edit a whole scene of a film going, I kind of want something like, let's say, yeah. like Chariots of Fire. You, yeah. know, you want like it, that sort of vibe, Vangelis kind of thing. I fucking did this today with a, I needed a voiceover because the music gives a little beat to it. Yeah, and I mean, what it also does is it sometimes forces you into making decisions you might not make otherwise. So, for example, um, and it, again, with the James film, mm. it worked out really, really nicely where every now and then I would have a piece of music um, that lasts three and a half minutes. And within that piece of music, I want to be able to hear bits of it because they're lyrics that are important. But I also want to use certain voice elements from interviews and things to tell a particular part of the story. If you don't have that music running underneath it, suddenly that piece can run five, six minutes. Yeah. But if you're suddenly setting this kind of limit to yourself, if I want to cover this in three and a half minutes, yeah. the music kind of helps you do that. So it helps you make sometimes quite hard decisions about what to leave out. And and it also, like I, I think if you, yeah, and I think also if you're working with music, it's kind of crazy not to let the music steer certain things, yeah. you know, in a particular way. Um, yeah, I definitely think I think that's definitely helpful. Been helpful for me at any rate, and and just and also to trust your own judgment on stuff. I mean, what's quite nice not having a client yeah. is I didn't have to show this to anyone to get their sort of approval. It's that your, it was it's okay to release. Yeah. It's like yeah, it's the director's cut. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's the only cut, but it's the director's cut. And I mean, there's something quite liberating about that as well, in a way, because you kind of sink or swim based on your own decisions. So you don't get to blame someone afterwards for, well, you know, I thought we should have done this, or I sort of thought we should have done that. Everything that's there, if it sucks or not, is a call I made, and I'm not sort of yeah, you know, I'm, I'm glad for that. Listen, um, one of the things that impressed me about the film was how you 
manage to do that depth of field effect with photographs because mm. that's a quite a, that, that, that's like a new technique in docu- yeah. documentaries. Well, I got to give all the credit to. Uh, funny enough, I always have to say the other Theo Kraus. There's a guy called Theo Kraus who's one of the three guys who shot the film. Funny enough, <laughs> I used the same approach to get the film shot for free <laughs> that yeah. I used for Rochtem before. Yeah. So I I made sure that no one of the three cameramen had to shoot too much. Yeah. So there was like. Cole Robenheimer shot the Cape Town stuff, Theo shot the Joburg stuff, and Barry Tomlin shot the stuff in Durban. So, again, no one person was loaded with, like, the whole film yeah, to shoot because no, no. nobody got paid on this thing. I mean, everybody did it for love and, you know, all that stuff. But, um, yeah, it, it's it's interesting. Um, it's very much uh, a new kind of technique. It's something I wish I could personally do. Mm. But Theo did it for me on probably 20 or 30 images in the film. And again, if there'd been budget and time, I'd have got him to do the lot. It, um, it so really, good. Yeah, and it, it really brings comes, it to life. Yeah, it absolutely does. Yeah. And, and again, it's not dishonest. Uh, no. You know, it's not as if, because I'm also a little bit yeah, about recreations and yeah. things. Um, yeah, but uh, what happens there, it, it just gives movement to a photograph. Yeah, that's and it's, the it's only sort thing of, it does. And yeah. it also pulls you into things in mm. a way that, that is slightly different. And it's funny, a, a lot of people don't even pick up on it. Well, they don't articulate it. Yeah. So they probably are aware that they're kind of watching it in a way they might not watch yeah. a slide. For me, who like three years ago realized what a harmony does in this <laughs> song, and I'm a fucking musician. <laughs> and I've been singing harmonies. I'm like, ah, oh, there's a harmony. Yeah, and it sounds like one voice. Yeah, no, other people because the the public won't pick up yeah. on a harmony, but the, they feel it w- when when they hear uh, "Mamma Mia, Mamma Mia, Figaro Magnifico," they think it's four guys singing. Yeah, that's four guys singing on fucking twenty yeah. harmonies yeah. overdubbed it's on fucking guys sixty singing. doubles. Yeah, exactly. You know, it's it's a, they they think it's four guys singing. Yeah, that that's the beauty of of making music and making films that you can. You can really bring something to life. Yeah, you know? I, I think what's also interesting for me is I've, I've watched the film now with a lot of audiences. Mm. Um, I get to do it again tomorrow night. We've got a screening at the lobby. And what's really nice is this thing of how when you watch it with an audience, mm. you get a sense of how they um, how they respond to things. Yeah. Um, and how certain things that you kind of weren't sure would work really work. Or yeah. in some cases, it lands straight over people's heads. Yeah. So the film is basically wall-to-wall music with the exception of, of one place where all the music drops out. And again, without giving anything away, it's amazing how powerful that point is when there's no music. Yeah, the note you're not playing. Because, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Shit, we got deep suddenly there, dude. Well. Yeah, but it, it is amazing and it's powerful. It, it, it makes a genuine um, impact and people don't necessarily go – Hey, there's no music here. There's been music the whole time, but they feel something. Yeah. Um, and yeah, it's it's really cool when that shit works because obviously that's a conscious decision. You've decided yeah. to do it that way. But it also kind of what do they say? You should. It's like uh, talking about film is like what dancing about architecture. <laughs> you know, it's like you sort of. It's like yeah, shouldn't, shouldn't talk about it. Just no, it we be, fucking you know? should talk about it. You know, <laughs> because the p- people should make more stories of these. Okay, now uh, to end off on um, yeah. Y- you guys are taking this film to London. It's been to a few film festivals. Yeah, it's been to a couple of festivals. The big one I'm hoping for, and I'm probably going to curse it, but fortunately there's a wooden table I can touch, yeah. is I've sent it for South by Southwest, which oh. is the, the big you know music festival in the in the States. And it's kind of – it's potentially interesting from a point of view of that it's um, it's people who have no attachment to him per se. So yeah. if it can work there – you know, what's the thing about, you know, if you make it there, you'll make it anywhere. So <laughs> yeah. I do think it would be amazing if it gets in. Um, it's got to be selected first. Um, but, yeah, it's 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 been really well received, and I'm really grateful that it's traveling and getting out. Um, but you guys are going to London. The, London, the, the, the yeah, um, uh, 27th in London, yeah. 23rd in Amsterdam. Um, and, yeah, you know, the, the thing that's also quite interesting with the film, of course, is it's theoretically uh, – there's no reason why it can't keep going. Yeah. It, it doesn't date yeah. per se. So, you know, I think that's a cool thing is that quite often if you make a film about sort of someone at a particular point in their career – um, funny enough, I enjoy sports documentaries. Yeah. I watch quite a lot of sports documentaries. There's some amazing – My favorite amazing. one is the, the Senna one, the oh, yeah. Ed and well, Senna one. Look, I mean, he's the guy who made Amy. Uh, yeah. He's the same director. And, I mean, they're both just incredible films. That, that's a very good example. Um, uh, you know, if someone is gone and it's a career retrospective, if you like, yeah. that film doesn't date. Yeah. 
if you make a film about you know uh, the guy who has just won the Formula One that year, yeah. you've got no way of knowing where the story is going to go. So I watched a terrible film about Mo Salah, who's that wonderful Egyptian footballer. And it's kind of lame because it's going like he came from here and he's now here and let's see what happens, you know. And it's kind of – it doesn't end. It can't end because – he, he's still doing it. This is the, the, that, that's the thing that bothers me about the Fukuf Blizzikar documentary as well. I, do, mm. I would have loved to have seen the docu now. Yeah. Like everything leading up to now. Well, also because, again, this is that wonderful thing of there's so much material. Yeah. So, I mean, you, th- there's no excuse to not make a great film when you can talk to the people involved, where they can look back on something and where you've got all yeah. this footage. That's the Belleville Rock City one. Eh? Yeah. yeah. No, no, no. That's uh, the uh, oh, forgive the, yeah, them. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah, 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 yeah. The, no, so what not was what the they one, do. There was the one that came out as a DVD with. There was a thing called Belleville Rock City, wasn't there? I think so. I think that was like a compilation yeah. or something. But yeah. but the thing is with uh, using that as an example is uh, that story continued. Yes. You now yeah. there's a lot of other stuff that happened after that. You yes. Know, so that that feels like a. It's like making the Justin Bieber documentary when he's 19. Yeah. Yeah. You know, no, I, absolutely. I, I would I would like to see the the docu when he's 45. Yeah. You know? <laughs> no, exactly. And I mean, I'm, look, I mean, I think the thing is is also if you are looking back at somebody's career or their body of work, mm. you also have a responsibility to treat it r- with respect. Yes. If somebody hires me to make a 10-minute thing for YouTube about their new album, it's a very, very, very different yeah. uh, responsibility to so-and-so is gone and this is to look back on their entire career and try and package it in 90 minutes. Yeah. So, yeah, there's a there's a responsibility with this kind of stuff too, I think, and I genuinely don't take it lightly. I mean, everything is a product of the time and the resources and all mm. that stuff, but – the intention is incredibly pure. <laughs> it's yeah. to try and really shine a light on their talent, let their music speak for them for, for itself, and um, and try and get a sense of who a person is, and also you know um, to make people feel something. Uh, with the rats film, I think it's funny as hell. I mean, I it's laugh. An awesome film. I, I love the fact that it is so funny. Yeah. Um, the James film is very funny in places, but it's it's heavy because yeah. he's gone, and it is a tragedy. It's a tragedy when someone that talented is taken early. Oh. And that applies to everyone from Senna to Van Gogh, you yeah. know? Yeah. But listen, um, Michael... First time they've ever been in a sentence together, <laughs> I think. Uh, thanks for not laughing out loud at that one. Eh? No, I was thinking, I was like, yeah, fucking Van Gogh, yeah, Senna. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> but, but thank you for doing this important work because yeah, man, it's, uh, it's, pleasure, it, it, yeah. it's, it's guys like you that uh, we need more of. Thank you, know? you People should go and see this film and, and thank you for coming in yeah. and, for, and for telling me your process in the story. The process. Yeah, the process. Oh what is your process? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, fantastic. Hey, with a bit of luck, it'll be on TV soon, so let's hold thumbs. Eh? Hopefully. Yeah, I'll fucking hold thumbs. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And for South by Southwest. You know West. anyone at CakeNet? Eh? I know, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Fire, put put in a good word. Eh? Yeah. Put in a good word. Fuck, I, should, I shouldn't have said that. Make some calls. <laughs> they need never hear that. <laughs> Dude, thank you so much. Uh, yeah, and, and um, dude, yeah, without blowing smoke up your ass, I mean, thank God you're doing what you're doing. I, mean, yeah, think I, about I, was, it. I was away, but I'm back now. Yeah, no, no, we can see. But seriously, I mean, um, it's it's important, and that's the thing as well, is it is important. Yeah, it's it important. It might be fun, but yeah, it's important. It's fucking fun, and you don't always get paid, but it's but it's important. Yeah, it matters. Eh? It I, matters. I, I hope that one of these interviews that I do would one day end up on one of your documentaries. Hey. I'm going to end the, the I'm going to end the interview on that one. Fantastic. <laughs> it's a deal. <laughs> Thank you Michael. Shut up. I hope you enjoyed my conversation with Michael Cross. If you are living in Amsterdam, you can go and see the film at the Zuid Afrika Huis on Tuesday the 23rd of October at half past 7. You can book at even M10 at zuidafrikahuis.nl that is e-v-e-n-e-m-e-n-t-e-n at zuidafrikahuis z-u-i-d-a-f-r-i-k-a h-u-i-s dot n-l yes so that read out was weird I'm except in a fucking parking lot ok geniet jou naweek en uh, kom volgende week terug van nog episode van wat met my Willem wel sy dan geet jou luister uh, gaan koop my nieuwe album Blitzkrieg op iTunes Steve from my email.